Now, I spoke to uh, many Labour strategists during the, the leadership contest and, of course, since then. And you were the person that they actually feared the most because you're very good at the dispatch box. You're a very, very good communicator. As I said earlier, a lot of um, younger Conservative listeners had messaged in and, you know, we were canvassing support and you, you, they were very much behind you. Would you ever throw your hat in the ring again? Labour should still be very afraid. So, Penny, thank you so much for uh, joining us on Times Radio. This is the week of International Women's Day. What does International Women's Day mean to you? So, I think it's it's a massive opportunity to come together, not just across the nation, but also uh, more powerfully across the world, to celebrate women and the progress that has been made, but also, and I think probably more importantly, to shine a spotlight on the things that are still to be done. And we, I think, all of us in Parliament, there's lots of issues that we face every day. We, we want to uh, ensure that uh, we're making progress on the, the equality roadmap to, uh, to help women uh, across the UK. But I think actually some of the most powerful things we do are when we shine the spotlight on some incredibly brave women who are doing fantastic work around the world for for women's rights, for human rights and democracy. And I think that's probably the most important thing it means to me. I mean, it's interesting because International Women's Day and it morphs out really across the month. It is, a, as you say, it's a time for us all to reflect and, and celebrate. But many feminists, um, people who don't think they're feminists but they care about gender equality, have said to me, it does feel like it's a tough time to be a woman right now, post-pandemic, the cost of living crisis. Internationally, we look at human rights being eroded in Afghanistan, Iran, reproductive rights being rolled back in America. Do you feel like feminism is struggling at the moment? So I think, think some of those things, there are some real events that, uh, that, that caused uh, um, a huge amount of damage to um, the opportunities that women have. COVID being a, a key one, and this, that's been very well documented. But I think in terms of us trying to get a spotlight on particular issues or uh, ensure that, uh, for example, women can participate in democracy and all of the things that we want to see, I think this is, this is symptomatic of, of what's happening with public debate, um, some very unpleasant things on social media. And all of these these challenges, you know, we overcome some obstacles and then we find there's a whole raft of new things in part driven by technology and that huge pace of change that that are hampering uh, women's rights. And I, I do think, uh, I mean, you've been writing about the, the um, I think you said it sounded, it was like a bit like a circular firing squad, you know, the sisterhood is fractured. I, I don't, I'm slightly more optimistic than that. And I suspect you are too. I, I do think, you know, it's moments like we've seen this week where, People have been supporting women in the UK, different political parties, but also around the world. I think uh, the sisterhood is alive and well and strong. But there are real challenges now in public discourse. There are new challenges and barriers to women getting into public office. And those things really need our attention. I hope I'm wrong about that, but it does feel that there are quite a lot of issues that are um, turning women who would have been allies against each other at the moment. There's quite a lot of division within the feminist movement. And one of those issues is over transgender rights. And what's been notable is that many senior female politicians, yourself during your, your leadership bid, Nicola Sturgeon, through the passage of, of this gender legislation built Rosie Duffield in the Labour Party it does feel that whatever you're whatever you're saying on transgender rights women are often getting really really attacked on that I mean what was that like for you when you went through the the leadership contest and that issue seemed to become a kind of stick which was used to beat you rather unfairly in a lot of people's minds so I think that I mean I gave a speech about this um, the, the other week and I think it's incredibly important on all public policy matters but particularly the ones that are really difficult and complex that we're able to have a good public debate about this and I, I actually think that uh, the the general public are much <laughs> there's much more consensus uh, out there than you would think when you look at the sort of extremes of um, arguments on social media whatever the issue is that's that's being discussed 
And uh, I think that is important. Freedom of speech is important, but it's not just important about what you want to say. It, the value of it is about being able to listen to other ideas, uh, to change your mind on things or to be unsure about things and want to learn more about something. I mean, that is one of the kind of great strengths of our democratic tradition. So I, I think we need to protect that. It's why even if I disagree with someone, I still want them to be heard and I want debate to be respectful. And I, But again, I think people understand that. They, they value that. I think certainly the public do. And do you think it's possible for us as uh, you know women committed to, to women's equality and advancement, can we start to have better conversations around some of the issues that divide us, particularly around the advancement of transgender rights and balancing that against biological sex and, and safe spaces? So I think we need, we need to be pragmatic in any issue that we're dealing with. But I actually think there is huge consensus. Um, and, uh, and, you know, what, what people want is they want to, they want everyone to be able to go around their, their daily lives um, to do the things that we all want to do, whether it's uh, to go to the gym or um, uh, to be in a relationship or all of, all of these things. And, and people, people want those things to be able to thrive as, uh, as human beings. And sometimes it is complicated to work out legislation if we need legislation to do uh, to help uh, set that rule book for for everyone and give everyone confidence about situations they're going to be in. But, you know, we, we are a democracy and it's democracies that do this best because uh, we listen to all voices. Um, ultimately, everyone gets a vote <laughs> at some stage. And... Uh, uh, and if decisions are wrong, they, they get corrected. That's that's the power of democracy. And did you feel bruised by that experience? No. I mean, I think, you know, you have good days and bad days. But, um, uh, you know, I if I didn't like this job, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it. Now, you mentioned about women in democracy. And a lot of women have said, including Nadine Doris, your, your colleague, and she said, look, I... I would think twice about asking a woman to stand because female parliamentarians do get so much um, abuse these days. And I think that's all across the, the political spectrum. What's been your own experience and what would you say to women who are put off by the stories they hear about, you know, the abuse that, that all female politicians get? So I, I would take a different view. and. I can talk about the, the negatives and actually there's some positives in those negatives, but this is an amazing job. It is, it, it is the most incredible job. You, you get to do stuff every day that is very moving, that helps people. Um, you get to make a difference every day. Sometimes it's in a, a very personal way with casework you're doing in your constituency. Other times it's about changing laws, uh, to, to help improve the country. Uh, and then on a on a personal development level, there's no other job like it. I, I remember going to a Women to Win event because I do a lot of work to encourage women to stand for office. And um, I, I used to give speeches and I just said, I'm not going to give another speech. I'm just going to read my diary. About, and I just did a week. And it was, uh, you name it, it was just the breadth of things that you get to do, the difference that you get to make, the personal experiences that you can have. That's... There's no other job like it. So, and I'd say to people, because women, I think we need to make a real effort with in terms of encouragement, because there are so many women out there who I think want to do this. And I'm a great believer, if you want to do something, chances are you're gonna be good at it. But so often women, their, their skills are up here, they're amazing, they're talented, they're dynamic, they're incredible communicators, they get things done, but their confidence levels are so low. And we see this in business, we see this in all walks of life. So we really need to encourage women to stand. If, uh, and it was a man, if a man had not said to me, you should run for office, I wouldn't have. I couldn't, you know, many of your listeners are probably saying, you know, damn him, but uh, had he not done that, I, w I would not have run. So uh, I think we need to encourage women and there are negatives, but uh, I have to say that in some respects, actually in many respects, I feel safer doing this job now than I have at any time in uh, in my political career. So that's really interesting what you've just said about 
it was a male colleague who encouraged you to to stand because one of the things that I really personally admire about you, and I think a lot of people really admire this in you, is that you have thrown your hat in the ring to be leader of the Conservative Party, not just once, and you had quite a bruising experience on that, but you did it <laughs> again. And I was interviewing a number of actually younger Conservatives um, and on my show, and lots of them said, we want Penny Morden to be the next leader because we think she's a breath of fresh air and she's a great communicator and she appeals to, to, to young people. Actually, a lot of people were very upset when you, you did get sort of knocked out the, the contest. But what was it that, that made you not just do it once, but, but do it twice to have the sort of confidence to, to do that? And before that male colleague had suggested it to you, had you been thinking about it? So I I had some uh, very good advice given to me by um, Margaret Thatcher. And she, I had many meetings with her and uh, some correspondence with her, but there were two letters that were particularly important to me. And uh, one of them was when I won my seat and she sent me a letter of congratulations, but I'm sure she did that to uh, a lot of uh, a lot of colleagues. But she had written to me five years before when I'd first run and I'd lost. I hadn't got a big enough swing to, to get in. And she said, get back on the horse. Um, and she, it was a very encouraging letter. And I think you, you know, if you want to do something, whether it's in politics, you're passionate about changing something, you're trying to get something to happen in your community, or uh, you are setting up a company, if you if you are passionate about these things, you need to keep going, and there will be setbacks. And in politics, you know, there's all kinds of setbacks on a pretty much hourly basis. But you need to know what it is you want to do, and you need to know where it is you you're heading. And I just think that that is, you know, that was good advice that she gave me. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it. I I would hope to be in a position to give you know other people such advice uh, I think you should keep going I mean, especially if you're trying to run for office you're trying to find a seat uh, you're trying to get selected it's it's uh, there's a lot of obstacles to overcome and we need to encourage people and we just need to also give them some confidence and hope where they're trying to head is is a good place to be because it is and who how do you keep resilient how do you build resilience as uh, a woman in, in politics particularly at your level of, of politics uh, and putting yourself out there I think the most important thing is to be able to get up every morning and know why you're doing the job um, you can you can put up with all sorts if you know what it is that you want to do and what you think you're doing the right thing what's your mission what's your political mission well, I have a list. <laughs> I love a woman so with a list. You, I mean, there were obviously this week, there's been very practical things I've been trying to get done. I've been trying to help a project in my patch. I've been trying to uh, uh, get a legislation program uh, in order for the fourth session. There are lots of practical things. But um, I think in politics, you need a to-do list and you need a to-be list as well. And actually, the second is, is just as important to the first because you, um, unlike other walks of life, you can't do this on your own and I don't just mean about colleagues in a political party or support across the house for particular things I mean you have to lead people uh, we, we all do even if you know we're not in cabinet or we're not a party leader you have to inspire people you have to persuade someone in your uh, constituency surgery to take a risk to try and get into work or um, to uh, to set up a second business what whatever it is you can't do that if you aren't authentic and you don't have the the credibility and reach you need to build that rapport with people and, and bluntly to build trust with people. And for me, that's what this job is about. That's why this job is particularly unique because it's not just about here's my to-do list. It's about what are other people's to-do lists and how can I help them achieve that and who helps you who is your kind of support team do you have a girl squad <laughs> do you have like a close group of friends that's because certainly when I worked for Harriet Harman and, and other you know female leaders you know 
they also had to have their own support network as well. So I I do. I mean, I, I get on with um, my colleagues. I'm not uh, necessarily part of a particular clique. I, I've always got on with people from across uh, the party. I get on with a lot of people on the other side of the house. I know. I know. It's shocking. And, um, and I think, you know, you... Doing this job, it's impossible not to be inspired by the people that you uh, work with in your constituency and people you meet uh, in Westminster. Um, Organisations, amazing people that we work with, other um, members of parliament in other nations who are who are doing amazing things. So it, you, you have that constant, you know, if you're down, you're not down for long because someone comes along and uh, you just think, wow, what an incredible, incredible person. So um, it's, it, there are negatives to the job, um, but there's no better job to be inspired and, um, you know, have your morale boosted. Now, I spoke to uh, many Labour strategists during the, the leadership contest and, of course, since then, and you were the person that they actually feared the most because you're very good at the dispatch box, you're very, very good communicator. As I said earlier, a lot of um, younger conservative listeners had messaged in and you know we were canvassing support and you, you, they were very much behind you. Would you ever throw your hat in the ring again? Oh, Lord. I, I think, I, it's a controversial view, but I think we want a period of stability and calm. No more parliamentary gymnastics. And look, I haven't disappeared, I'm, I'm still here. I'm doing what I have always done, which is to be part of the conservative team and get get some good things to happen. So Labour should still be very afraid. <laughs> now, listen, um, in your um, position as um, leader of the um, House, you're looking at, at strengthening the, the independent complaints and, and grievances um, system and uh, just this week on Times Radio, a Labour MP, Charlotte Nichols, told John Pina that she had been sexually assaulted by a, a colleague, which is, you know, pretty shocking, but it's something that we have heard before. What more needs to be done to make Westminster safer for, for women? So I think there are, there are many things, but just to give you two examples that I'm I'm very focused on. One is actually not so much regarding the House of Commons, but it is regarding um, Whitehall. And we've never had uh, a ministerial HR function in Whitehall. And I think this is a huge problem. There's some practical difficulties that are caused by it. Uh, people are paid and sometimes they're not paid. Um, when they move between departments, as we often do, we have lo lots of reshuffles happen. People are having to fill in the same forms they filled in as a minister in the previous department. There's no continuity of information. But also, if something goes wrong for a minister, if, for example, they are assaulted, um, the, they, they don't really have uh, a, a pastoral care system in, in Whitehall, in their ministerial role, that they can call on for assistance. So that is now being set up by the Propriety and Ethics team. Uh, they've just started doing that. And I think that will be game-changing. Um, you know, ministers are under a lot of pressure. Sometimes they have tragic things happen to them or actually experience uh, very tragic things. And um, uh, I think having support there where that happens to look after them, but also for the benefit of uh, who they're working with as well is really important. With regard to the House of Commons, there are many, uh, we have 13 different um, uh, standards, uh, bodies and, and organisations. And what I have asked the House of Commons Commission to do is bring someone in from outside to look at the whole of the, of the standards and ethics landscape. Someone who is uh, um, one of the best people in the country in my view of, um, uh, of good HR practice. Because sometimes I think we get... Uh, we're so focused on building particular rule books, we forget sometimes to look at the whole picture and think about what's the what's the outcome we want uh, for for all members of parliament and staff who who work here. Um, and I was very I did see um, that uh, interview yesterday. I think it was um, obviously very distressing 
to to hear that there are processes people can go through but um, we can always do better in this and I know that actually the whole commission um, uh, the speaker included uh, are very focused on actually making sure we we have we have great practices in place and people feel confident about the workplace that they're in because of course a big thing about getting to the Palace of Westminster at whatever level you are whether you're a parliamentarian or a peer, or, or a member of staff, or, or an advisor. A lot of it is about power dynamics. I mean, that's often where abuse of, of power happens, and with young women and increasingly young men uh, as well. I mean, how much do you think that culture can only change when you do have more women, not just the old woman in a senior position, but that critical mass of women in more senior positions. Do you think that will make a difference to the culture? I think it does make a difference. And we know that from every profession, it, it really does. Uh, and I think it also gives people confidence uh, in, in a system, confidence that their concerns and worries will be, will be heard. Um, I also think that it's not just about uh, particular policies that, that look at uh, you know, if, if someone has uh, has been assaulted or someone ha has, uh, you know, faced um, sexual harassment, it's not just those sets of policies. It is about everything across the piece. This is not a normal job. Um, there are very unique pressures in it. And um, oh, there's also a lot of boozing in it as well. There's a lot of nighttime work and parties and receptions and and alcohol, that's quite a heady mix. So there's there's those sorts of things. There are quite unique pressures that you face. And unlike other jobs, you're sometimes not trained to deal with those things. Um, and, uh, and, and that can have a, a bad outcome as well. I mean, just to give you an example, and it's not just MPs, it's staff as well. Um, what MPs had to do during op pitting where we were evacuating Afghanistan, um, I mean, just tremendously traumatic conversations with people who are uh, facing death. Um, and, uh, you know, those are, those are, we might have one or two of those kind of conversations a year, but my office dealt with 1,200 cases in, the, in those few weeks. So lots of, lots of pressures, and there are lots of jobs which face similar pressures. But I think how we, how we prepare both members of parliament and their parliamentary staff is really critical. And that is another area I'm really interested in about how you build personal resilience and how you get, despite being pulled in all directions, uh, a focus on uh, what's reasonable, what's appropriate behavior, uh, when to recognize if you're, you've pushed yourself too far. All of these things I think are really important to, to uh, getting a professional workplace. And in the mix of course of all of that is is civil servants as well because they play an incredibly important role in in delivering the the mission of, of of ministers and government and yet we have lots of reports of bullying going on from cabinet ministers the home secretary um is involved in a, a scandal about an email blaming civil servants do you think cabinet ministers need a bit of training about how to work better with civil servants i was both a civil servant and a special advisor um, when I was in government. And those relationships between minister, private office, advisors and civil service are so, so important. But it does feel that there's a bit of a war going on between cabinet ministers and civil servants. How do you think things can be improved? So I'd say two things. The first is um, my experience of working with the civil service has always been really good. And I've, been, I've worked in a, a, a large number of departments, um, and so I don't necessarily think it's just luck. And I've always, as a minister, I've always taken time to widen the contact I might have with different people in the department. I'm a great believer in floor walks. And uh, also just putting... Not leaving messages. <laughs> no, but not leaving messages, no. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I, um, I also think putting out there the problems you're grappling with as a minister, people want to know what that is. They want to, I mean, I remember in DWP, I was trying to do something and people kept telling me it was, you can't do that. It's too, you, you, you know, that you, that's too complicated. It won't work. And I was doing a floor walk and I found a chap who in his lunch hour 
have been working on this for like the last five years because he was passionate about it too and it was it was a really important thing and um so i find that you know people do those jobs because they are motivated they're interested in that that subject matter they know a lot more about it than you ever will most likely and so really take the advice and they want to help and your job as a minister is to give clarity of direction it's to motivate people Sometimes you need to do that, particularly if you're you know you're taking a risk on something and changing the way that you you do things. But that's that's part of your job. And I think there's been a lot of work that's been done. The um, the administration committee in the Commons, for example, looking at the dynamics between ministers, perm sex, and uh, and departments. The Institute for Government does a lot of good work on this. We know what really needs to happen. We just got to do it. And the reason why we haven't done it today is because there's never been an HR function in Whitehall looking at ministers and all of those things. That is starting to happen now. Just to push back on that a little bit, because I've worked in a number of departments. In fact, I was actually a special advisor in the leader's office and you're the mm. the leader's office and the fantastic civil servants in, in the leader's They are. They absolutely are. Absolutely brilliant. You clearly have had a good relationship with, with many of your civil servants across different departments. I had a good relationship as a civil servant and as a special advisor. That doesn't require an HR team. That just requires a, a person who is willing to make good contacts with the civil service to do the floor walks, as you're seeing. Isn't it that some of your colleagues just aren't very good at reaching out to, to having those relationships with their civil servants? So look, there are there are people that have um, particular uh skills and uh, they're good at empathy or they're great communicators um, and and that's fantastic. Sometimes that doesn't come uh, naturally to people. I, uh, I'm i quite an introvert, believe it or not. Um, I am terrible with remembering people's names. So I, I develop systems to enable me to do that. Training and support is really important and I think actually just again as any walk of life, what People want to be able to do their best. Uh, and uh, I think training, a lot of people have coaches. Uh, a lot of people um, make use of external schemes. Um, again, the, the Institute for Government has a coaching program for, for ministers. And uh, I, I want to see Whitehall itself start to stand up some of these services that are also more relevant to uh, to junior ministers in, in particular. So. Look, there's lots, there's lots we can do to support people be the best they can be. But I think actually that's what ministers want to be. And if Dominic Raab is found to have um, behaved inappropriately or or bullied civil servants, do you think he should go at that point? He's, I mean, he's he's said that, uh, and you know, people should take confidence that there is, uh, there are processes to review these things. Uh, again, people are thinking upstream. Uh, again, refer to the work that. Uh, reports commissioned by the um, by the administration committee. Uh, you know, people want this to work. Um, I, I did a, uh, I had a meeting with um, all the perm sex uh, yesterday with my counterpart in the Lords, and we were looking at ways that we could, uh, we could best ensure the quality of what's being done in Department serves Parliament, uh, but also we've got that, that good re- two-way relationship as well. So people spend a lot of time trying to ensure that we're we're all firing on all cylinders and we're we're all supporting all the component parts of this ultimately we're all here to serve the country and to to get the best things to happen now we're just coming to the end of our time and i just want to sort of finish this looking at the the raw politics right now um the conservatives are, are trailing behind in the polls of course next general election possibly over a year away a lot can change in that time Things look like they're pretty difficult at the moment. Obviously, you know, Rishi Sunak is now the, the Prime Minister. How do you think the Conservative Party can turn things around? So, look, I th- I think Rishi is doing the, the right thing. We, we're facing these unprecedented challenges. Um, we are supporting a, an ally in a terrible war, which has uh, huge economic shocks uh, to, to us, but also... Uh, other things that we are concerned about and uh, and other nations too. We have got this massive catch-up job from COVID and only some of the um, the implications of that are really now coming to, uh, to the fore. We also have huge ambition to deliver on. Uh, the Brexit 
dividend and actually making that step change in terms of our statute book and all, all of that means there is a huge amount to do. And we've been through some really, really tough times. And I think the Prime Minister understands that we have to get some of those basics right. We, he's set out those uh, five priorities, three economic access to uh, to the NHS and uh, obviously stopping the boats, which we've heard so much about this week. He's right to do that. He's got to focus on those immediate things. And then he can start to set out uh, a vision, which he started to do at the beginning do you of this year. Not enough time to do all of that because you know you've set out an argument there about the fact that lots of things have gone wrong and it has been a very very difficult time. But for many of my listeners, for many of the public, they don't care about that. They're just having a really really tough time, punishing cost of living crisis. They're not seeing this Brexit dividend. You know, the public doesn't think Brexit is going so well. They've seen this huge amount of instability at the top of the Conservative Party. Quite a lot of them are just fed up. They don't want the excuses. How do you think you can turn things around when we're really talking about 18 months? So people, you know, we, we will only um, turn that when people, uh, not not by saying to people that we understand how they feel and uh, and what needs to be done, but when they start to feel the difference from the things that we are doing. And that is why Steve Barclay has been working to ensure people can get access to healthcare, really focusing in on what are the what are the barriers to that, massively increasing diagnostics, to give you one example. Uh, why we're doing this, um, yes, controversial, but I think absolutely necessary legislation to, to give ourselves every chance of making sure our asylum system and... Uh, uh, and complementary systems are, are working really well, all of these things. And with regard to cost of living, uh, you know, we we have always been focused on ensuring that people can keep uh, the money that they earn. We've doubled, you know, personal taxation thresholds since we've been in office, for example. And we have this unprecedented levels of support to, to get us through these tough times. There are going to be challenges ahead. Uh, the Ukraine war, I'm, I'm fearful, will not be over swiftly but we will get the country through it and uh and i think that you know again we will we will start to see improvements uh soon but uh just saying that is not going to convince anyone do you people see will feel it's a really tough time and you have got a really difficult mountain to climb of course but I mean, that's got... local elections coming up very soon which will be the first time rishi sunak has been tested at the the ballot box and then the general election will come pretty soon after that. But this is this is where we will be measured from. And, uh, you know, anyone can run a country when everything is going hunky-dory. Um, in these times, you need people that can take tough decisions, uh, can build confidence and trust, can can steady things in uncertain times. And that's, that's what the Prime Minister is doing. We, uh, you know, week is a long time in politics, as we all know. Uh, but uh, we are not wasting any time at all. Uh, we want to deliver on these things. Uh, we are making, I mean, my uh, my in-tray is uh, full of things that are going to update our, our statute book and enable us to move at the speed that business and science needs us to. Uh, and uh, and very shortly, I, I think you'll be getting some very good news on trade. So there, there is some good things happening. And... Uh, and these are the things that need to make a tangible difference to people's lives. And final, final question to you. Um, what are your thoughts on any prospective return of Boris Johnson? <laughs> well, has he gone away? <laughs> if he has gone away, I haven't noticed. Um, look, he is, uh, he is a, a central figure in, uh, in public life. I think he's going to be around for a lot of the time. <laughs> um, but he is, uh, I mean, he's doing... He's looking after his constituency. He's also uh, keeping, well, I think he is. Um, uh, he's also uh, doing some some great stuff to make sure that support for Ukraine is still strong. Uh, he's he's doing constructive things and that's in his entree. Um, and I'm focused on helping the Prime Minister deal with his. Penny Morden, we're really grateful for your time. Thanks for speaking with Times Radio. Thank you.